The game is over. Really, there was nothing you could have done. Sometimes Cranko just does Cranko things, floods the board out with hundreds of goblin tokens, and then... That's all she wrote. You never really had any removal to target Cranko with. But then the Esper player sighs as you're shuffling up for the next game and says, You really shouldn't have attacked me on turn 4. I had a board wipe that I could have used if I had got back to my turn. Really, you should have let me live. Hello and welcome to another episode of Gemstone Mine. I'm John, and today we're going to try to answer the question of when is the right time to eliminate an opponent? Unlike 1v1 magic, eliminating a player does not necessarily translate to winning the game. We've talked before about the idea that in a four-player commander pod, you may have three opponents, but you also have two allies. If one of your opponents tries to make a big move, you may not be the only one who's trying to stop them. And sometimes, you need to consider who the biggest threat at the table is to your game plan in particular. I had considered labeling this another one of our lessons from CEDH episodes, and it really is a skill that you will see win conless stacks players flex to eliminate key players on their road to victory in CDH pods. But honestly, I felt that this was more of a skill you develop from more casual games of Commander. I hope you still enjoy this one, even if it's not a classic lesson from CDH. If you do, I hope you'll consider giving the episode a like or throwing us a subscribe on YouTube, as that really does help us out a lot. And speaking of casual magic, the first consideration we have for whether or not to eliminate a player is actually a very simple one. How close is your game of Commander to board game night? Sometimes the social contract of your game is such that players shouldn't be sitting around for half an hour after being eliminated early. Sometimes it is considered gauche to attack the player who missed their three land drops and is hellbent. Some groups do expect the game to end in a series of quick alpha strikes where players are eliminated one after the other in combat in relatively short succession. If this is one of your playgroups, it's generally not right to score early eliminations, no matter how tactically advantageous it may be for you. I wanted to be sure to acknowledge this early in the episode, as the rest of this episode is going to be much more analytical, and sometimes the correct analysis begins and ends with the rule zero conversation. What we're really seeking to do when we try to analyze which player to eliminate first is the goal of breaking the stalemate of the game in your favor. The longest part of most commander games is the all set up stage, where players have their game plan more or less online, and they have adequate resources of card advantage and mana ramp in order to cast multiple spells or take multiple spell-like game actions each turn. This gives them the option to both advance their own game plan while also being able to answer threats played by their opponents during a particular round of the table. In battlecruiser type games in particular, this stage of the game often sees players building up larger and larger board states with creatures and other permanents until one player draws a card which lets them break the stalemate, often a force multiplier of some kind, or an answer that removes a key threat which prevented them from attacking profitably. A player being knocked out of the game is sometimes the stalemate breaker, where player 1 may have been quite capable of attacking player 2 for lethal for several turns, but they also couldn't then survive the crackback from both players 3 and 4 after they tapped out to go all out with an attack. If you're trying to play optimally, your goal is to make sure that the stalemate during the all setup stage of the game breaks in your favor so you are the one who is best positioned to win after the first elimination. Sometimes it is correct to eliminate the player who's farthest ahead, the greatest threat to everyone at the table. But sometimes the arch enemy is the one keeping multiple players in check and you need to keep them around. And sometimes even the meager presence of the person all the way in last place is all that's keeping the balance, and eliminating them will pave the way to your victory. Try to assess where each player will focus their resources if one particular player is removed. If you have the second best enchantment on the table, eliminating the enchantress player may make you target number one for enchantment removal. Try to identify which players are afraid of or hampered by what cards on the table. If the landfall player is bemoaning Archon of Emeria, which makes all of their non-basic lands enter the battlefield tapped, that's a pretty good indication, for example. So you may, in this case, decide to eliminate the quote-unquote weakened landfall player, 
before you turn your attention to the player with Archon of Emeria, all other things being equal, because the Archon of Emeria player is the one who is holding the Landfall player in check. Or maybe there's a Voltron player piloting Grevin, Predator Captain, and they're the person who's holding the Tokens player in check because if the Tokens player swings out, the Voltron player can crack back and eliminate them in a single blow. In that case, the correct order of operations may be to eliminate the Tokens player first and keep Grevin around just to keep the Tokens player in check while you're attacking. The questions we'll ask ourselves when trying to determine how we are going to break the stalemate in our favor is first to try to eliminate the greatest threat to our game plan. Identify what your game plan is going to be and how each other player at the table might be able to stop that game plan. Stopping your game plan in this case meaning how far can they set you back? Are they only keeping you from going for it or do they already have such a powerful effect on board that you're virtually back to getting ready? For example, if you're the Naya Tokens player and one of your opponents controls Elish Norn, giving your entire board minus two, minus two, and making it impossible for you to keep your tokens online at all, that's probably way more devastating to your game plan than the player to their right who only has a ghostly prison out. If you're stuck in getting ready because Elish Norn is staying on the battlefield, all the Ghostly Prison really does is keep you all set up instead of going for it against Ghostly Prison's controller. Proper threat assessment identifies that Elish Norn's controller is the greater threat to your game plan. And if the opportunity presents itself for you to help eliminate Elish Norn's controller, such as helping the Aristocrats player ping them down with Bastion of Remembrance triggers by protecting that enchantment with your own counter magic, that may be the correct path to victory for you even if you're taking damage from the triggers as well. Again, so long as you can comfortably say that you have more life than the Elish Norn player and you will last longer. On the other hand, if you're the player at the table who will be winning with a combo on the stack with just instants and sorceries, you may want to focus your combat damage on the blue player, as they are the ones who are most likely to have counter magic that can stop your instants and sorceries. You also want to consider what other players may have in their decks which you don't, cards which you may still want to see cast as you navigate your path to victory. We've said before that in a commander game you may have three opponents but you also have two allies, and sometimes the entire table needs to band together to stop the one player who's managed to get far ahead, sometimes earning the label of arch enemy. Imagine the Naya Tokens player gets off to a fast start. They've got their mana dorks online, they're flooding the board with tokens, and they're about to play their commander to start beating in for severe damage. While you might be nervous about the incoming damage, desperately trying to dig for a board wipe, you may also have two other players who are also looking for ways to wipe the board and reset that Naya player. From the Naya player's perspective, every card an opponent draws is another chance for them to lose their board, and assuming no other draw spells being cast, the table is out drawing them 3 to 1. So the next question to ask yourself is, which players do you need? Your opponents might be controlling static stacks effects like Rule of Law or a group hug piece like Curse of Opulence, and these may be things that you could play around or be best positioned to take advantage of, giving you what amounts to free game actions. Maybe you want the Rule of Law player to stick around because they just spent three mana and a card from their hand to make sure that the Storm deck and the Enchantress deck are not able to do much of anything while your Flash deck, which intends to play spells at instant speed on other players' turns, is doing just fine. And maybe you really need the person with a lot of counter spells to stick around, since your Orzhov deck has no real good way to interact with the stack and stop the Spellslinger player from going for it. When do you weigh the potential threat a player presents to your game plan more or less heavily than their potential value as an ally? It all comes down to which stage of the game you're in. The closer you are to going for it, the more important it is for you to remove the bigger threats to your game plan. And the farther you are from it, the closer you are to getting ready or all set up, the more you'll depend on potential allies to keep the game going long enough for you to eventually enact your game plan and go for the win. Slower value-based decks are more likely to see preserving an ally as beneficial, while more focused decks are trying to eliminate threats to their game plan as quickly as possible.
A lot of this goes out the window when you're playing combos closer to CEDH, where attempting to win the game on the spot and eliminate multiple opponents all at once kind of means that everybody is going to be eliminated at the same time, and you need this calculus a little bit less. But when you have to focus down one player at a time, it's helpful to ask yourself the age-old question of who's the beatdown. Who's going to win if the game goes short or if the game goes long? Who is going to stop you from enacting your game plan and going for it? They need to be eliminated first. On the other hand, if you're still several turns away from being able to go for it, you probably want to stop the person who's closest to going for it from being able to enact their game plan. They may be the first person you want to eliminate while you try to ride along with the other value-based decks at the table. When you have options for players to eliminate, it's important to consider those key questions. Number one, is this the type of game or playgroup where eliminating a player early is socially acceptable, or are we trying to keep everyone in the game until the game is almost over? Next, you want to consider how you're going to break the stalemate in your favor. This breaks down into two other basic questions. Number two, which player poses the greatest potential threat to your game plan? And number three, which player is the best potential ally you have for enacting your game plan? Number four, Weighing the importance of eliminating threats versus the importance of preserving an ally comes down to our next question. Are you going for it, or are you still all set up? If you're going for it, you probably want the game to be over fast, and eliminating threats to your game plan is far more important. But if you're still in the all set up stages of the game, or possibly even still getting ready, you really want to preserve allies who can help control your opponents for you and ensure that you see enough turns in that game to see your game plan enacted. What do you think? Tell us about how you decide what players to eliminate. And hopefully, don't just vote you're going to eliminate me first. I didn't do anything. Really, it was the person with LS Norn you should be going after first. You can send us an email at gemstonemindpodcast at gmail.com. You can add us on Twitter, where we are at gemstonemindmtg, Or you can leave us a comment on YouTube, where we are Gemstone Mine Podcast. If you enjoyed the episode, please don't forget to like and subscribe. Until next time, I'm John, and this is Gemstone Mine.